The first section of DISC-2 deals with the use of berberine in dealing with insulin insensitivity and diabetes. So I titled this section, Berberine and the Evil Doers of Insulin Resistance, Cytokines, Free Fatty Acids, and Queen Jadis herself, ICPA kinase. To review, the decision to increase cholesterol production is a bad decision. It's a missed decision. Our body thinks we have another infection. We're misinterpreting inflammation generated by our diet, which is high in sugar and fat, inflammation generated by belly fat, environmental toxins, leaky gut, infection, gingivitis, and allergy. We think it's another infection, so we will upregulate HMG coiroductase to make more cholesterol. We'll activate our inflammatory pathways, more inflammatory cytokines, more oxidative stress. We get hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, which we're going to focus on in this section, more bullets. Great when you want to fight an infection, but not so good when you're modern man suffering from hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, and atherosclerosis. The decision to generate cholesterol is the decision to generate superoxide free radicals from NADPH oxidase to make our white cells into killing machines. Unfortunately, they're killing the cells that line our arteries. We're going to activate ICPA kinase, Queen Jadis, the mediator of inflammation, ampli am inflammation amplification. When our cells experience a threat, lipopolysaccharide, free fatty acids, we're going to initiate a chain reaction of serine kinases. We're going to activate the Queen Jadis molecule, ICPA kinase. We're going to release nuclear factor capovate in the nucleus to code for inflammatory mediators and um, oxidative stress mechanisms. Inflammation leads to hyperlipidemia. We see upticks in cholesterol, LDL, and triglycerides. The cells of the periphery make more LDL receptors, whereas the liver makes fewer. And, and so with inflammation, our cells will engorge with lipids, and we can block that as we learned with berberine. With inflammation, cholesterol esterification within our cells increases. So the, the level of free cholesterol in the cell is lower than it would be without inflammation. So SCAP senses this, sends sterile regulatory element binding protein in the nucleus, and we're inappropriately making LDL receptors. This promotes cholesterol generation and egress from the liver and incorporation into the peripheral cells, such as our white cells, and this mediates atherosclerosis. When our LDL is oxidized, it looks like a microbe, and it will be it, it taken up by the cells through their scavenger receptors, which normally handle bacteria, but the oxidized LDL looks like a microbe, again, driving forward atherosclerosis. As we'll talk about in this section, ICPA kinase, Queen Jadis, not, as, not only does she shoot nuclear factor kappa beta in the nucleus to make free radicals and inflammatory mediators, she will serine phosphorylate the insulin receptor and its downstream signaling molecules to produce insulin insensitivity. That makes sense if you got an infection because your white cells need sugar, but it's not a good thing if you're an overweight adult with type 2 diabetes. Insulin works by promoting tyrosine phosphorylation of its downstream receptors. ICPA kinase and inflammation blunts this by causing serine phosphorylation. There's kind of like a battle. Tyrine phosphorylation to promote insulin sensitivity, serine phosphorylation, the response to inflammation to cause insulin resistance. Berberine activates AMP-sensitive protein kinase, sending a burn, do not build signal. We want to slow down the rate of cell proliferation. We want to lower cholesterol and triglycerides. We want to blunt oxidative stress. We want to blunt inflammation. And we'll talk about how upregulation of AMP sensitive protein kinase improves glucose control and helps with weight management. Berberine activates AMPK to lower lipids. We'll focus on glucose metabolism. Insulin receptor expression increases, and we promote beneficial physiologic tyrosine phosphorylation of the downstream 
enzymes that mediate insulin activity. We're going to blunt insulin insensitivity due to inflammation, lipopolysaccharide, fatty acids, and cytokines, and this will provide physiologic protection against the consequences of hyperglycemia, nephropathy, neuropathy, retinopathy, and cardiomyopathy. Berberine promotes tyrosine phosphorylation, directly inhibiting the deleterious effects of queen jadis. So if we can promote tyrosine phosphorylation, we can block insulin insensitivity that would otherwise occur due to inflammation. So that's the, the basics of the physiology, which we will review later on. Let me give you a clinical study of berberine in metabolic syndrome. Most of my new patients have metabolic syndrome. This is the constellation of belly fat, visceral fat, high blood pressure, low HDL, high triglycerides, high sugar. 37 adults with newly diagnosed and not yet treated metabolic syndrome. We're going to do baseline studies. We're going to treat them all with berberine, 300 milligrams TID, that's three times a day. Repeat these measurements at 12 weeks. Um, berberine therapy was safe. Nuisance GI side effects in 5%, constipation, diarrhea, and those side effects would resolve with a dose decrease. No adverse effects on liver chemistries or kidney chemistries. Now, lipids drop. 37 point drop in cholesterol. Again, that's that 20% cutoff. We're going to decrease your risk of an event by 20% if we get you down by 38 points. So cholesterol drops, LDL drops, HDL drops a little bit. The only negative effect of berberine is it tends to drop the HDL, but HDL as a percentage of total cholesterol will rise. Triglycerides fall nicely. Fasting glucose falls from 132 to 110. That's pretty good, a 22 point drop. We're lowering cholesterol and decreasing risk. We're lowering triglycerides, we're lowering LDL, we're lowering blood sugar. Insulin levels fall. In type two diabetes, you're making plenty of insulin, but it's not working well. You have insulin resistance, so the pancreas has to make too much insulin. A decrease in insulin level means that insulin sensitivity is improved, the pancreas is less overworked, HOMA is a marker of, of insulin resistance, it falls, leptin rises in relation to visceral adiposity, it drops with berberine, adiponectin rises when you're losing weight. Adiponectin is protective against arterial disease, it's anti-inflammatory, lean, athletic people have high leptin levels, I, excuse me, have high adiponectin levels, berberine mimics this because it mimics AMPK, which is increased by being trim and being athletic. Blood pressure falls, body mass index falls, waist circumference falls because you're getting rid of belly fat. Okay, so it works well in, in metabolic syndrome. How about in type 2 diabetes? 110 adult subjects with newly diagnosed and not yet treated type 2 diabetes. They had a fasting sugar above 125 or a post-glucose load sugar of 200. They had high triglycerides above 150 and their cholesterol was high. You put them all on diet and exercise, do baseline measurements, randomize them to receive over 12 weeks, berberine 500 mg twice daily or placebo. You repeat the measurements at 12 weeks. Double blind protocol was followed. Neither the subjects nor the researchers knew who was taking placebo, who was taking berberine. You see in both groups, weight falls, maybe it falls a little bit more with berberine, so diet and exercise did have some effect. Body mass index falls by one point in both groups. Blood pressure falls in both groups. Systolic, a little bit more with berberine, similar drops in diastolic blood pressure. Glucose values fall seven points with placebo, 15 points with berberine. Post-meal glucose, falls with both groups, it falls a lot more with berberine. Fasting insulin is not affected by diet and exercise, it drops if you add in berberine. Two hour post glucose load insulin also falls more with berberine. Again, we got that 37 point drop, lowering our risk by about 20%. Here with placebo, you can see not a whole lot's going on with cholesterol, a lot's going on with berberine, LDL falls more with berberine, triglycerides falls more with berberine. Interleukin-6 is an inflammatory cytokine. It's the work product of Queen Jadis. When she translocates nuclear factor cap into the nucleus, we make interleukin-6. It drops with both groups. Diet and exercise is a good idea. It drops more with berberine. Liver chemistries improve. Berberine protects the liver. It protects the brain. It protects the kidney. 
Many of the drugs I give you raise liver chemistries because they have toxic effects on the liver. Berberine does just the opposite. It protects the liver against toxicity and lowers liver chemistries. Um, so fatty liver will improve with berberine. The route into Narnia is through the wardrobe and then you follow the path by the lamppost. The route for insulin to have its anabolic effects is through the insulin receptor. So let's look at berberine and insulin receptor expression. We're going to take Hep G2 cells. These are immortalized liver cells that are used in cell culture studies. We're going to incubate them with berberine at increasing concentrations over, or over increasing time durations. We're going to evaluate insulin receptor messenger RNA expression, insulin receptor protein expression and function, and LDL receptor expression. So are we going to transcribe more insulin receptor messenger RNA? Are we going to translate it into the protein? Are we going to put it on the cell membrane? And we're also going to look at LDL receptor expression on the cell membrane. We see transcription of messenger RNA for the insulin receptor rises with berberine in a dose and time dependent fashion. More berberine over longer periods of time, we see greater transcription of the messenger RNA for the um, insulin receptor. We see increased expression on the cell membrane of the insulin receptor. And as we increase expression of the insulin receptor, we're also increasing expression of the LDL receptor. We want high levels of insulin receptors and LDL receptors on our cells. This is achieved with berberine. No drug can do this. Now, we're going to look at cellular glucose uptake. Um, insulin will bind the insulin receptor, initiating a tyrosine phosphorylation chain reaction such that glucose will be taken up into the cell. So here we have, under control conditions, we add in insulin, the cells take up a little bit more glucose. Berberine has minimal effect at rest, but you can see there's a synergy between insulin and berberine. Berberine is enhancing insulin sensitivity. Your insulin works better in the presence of berberine because berberine upregulates production of the insulin receptor. More insulin receptors, the greater the effect of any given dose of insulin. Now, we can repeat this with a silencing interfer interfering RNA for the insulin receptor. We're going to block production of the insulin receptor. And here you can see that the beneficial effects of berberine on insulin and insulin sensitivity are lost. Berberine enhances insulin sensitivity, but it's dependent upon insulin receptor expression and function. No insulin receptors, insulin's not going to work, berberine cannot help. But berberine will enhance insulin sensitivity, and we need insulin receptors for berberine to be effective. Now, cellular glucose uptake rises in response to insulin and berberine. Wart Mannin blocks PI3K. PI3K is phosphoinositol 3 kinase. It's sometimes also called AKT. PI3K, AKT is downstream in the insulin signaling pathway. So insulin will ligate its receptor, tyrosine phosphorylate insulin receptor 1 substrate, which will then activate PI3K, and that's important insulin signaling. If we knock this out, berberine does not work. Work man and blocks berberine induced upregulation of insulin signaling. So for berberine to work, we need insulin receptors and we need an intact downstream pathway. We're going to look here at insulin receptor promoter activity. Are we going to be transcribing messenger RNA for the insulin receptor? And this rises if you incubate the cells with berberine in a dose-dependent fashion. Berberine stimulates insulin receptor messenger RNA transcription. It doesn't stabilize the insulin receptor messenger RNA. That's how it works with the LDL receptor. Here it directly increases transcription of the insulin receptor. So in our prior section, we showed that berberine blocks transcription of PCSK9. It stabilizes messenger RNA of the LDL receptor. That's how you get more LDL receptors and lower LDLs. Here we're showing that berberine increases transcription of the insulin receptor. It sits on the promoter site and causes our body to make more messenger RNA for the insulin receptor. That, that messenger RNA is translated. We have more insulin receptors on the cell membrane, greater insulin sensitivity. Berberine stimulates protein kinase C. 
Protein kinase C stimulates the insulin receptor promoter. So the pathway is berberine, protein kinase C, um, insulin receptor promoter. We're going to transcribe the messenger RNA. We're going to translate it into protein. We're going to put it on the cell membrane. We're going to activate the insulin receptor. We're going to activate the PI3K pathway and improve insulin signaling. Nod mice are genetically abnormal type 1 diabetic mice. They don't make any insulin. They have insulin-dependent diabetes. They have a high sugar, and giving them berberine does nothing because they have no insulin. So we can make all the insulin receptors we want. They got no insulin. Nothing will happen. They have very low levels of insulin because their pancreas has failed, and giving them berberine will do nothing. KKAY mice are genetically type 2 diabetic overweight mice. They're, they act like adults with metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes. And they have high levels of insulin. Their pancreas is making plenty of insulin, but they have insulin insensitivity, so their blood sugar is still high. The pancreas responds by making more of this insulin that's not working so well. In response to berberine, glucose falls and insulin falls. We improve insulin sensitivity, blood sugar falls, the pancreas doesn't have to make as much of this insulin, which is ineffective. Now, let's look at a, a variety of different human cells, not just the Hep G2 cells, but lymphocytes, pancreatic cells, colon cancer cells, fibroblast cells, incubate with berberine, they all upregulate expression of the insulin receptor. So it appears that every cell in the body will respond to berberine by making more insulin receptors. So every cell in the body, every organ in the body will exhibit enhanced insulin sensitivity with berberine. Here we're going to look at cell membrane insulin receptor expression. The insulin receptor beta subunit increases with berberine. Insulin will lead to activation of its receptor, tyrosine phosphorylation of AKT, phosphorylation of the insulin receptor beta subunit. So we want to see phosphorylation of AKT. And with low-dose insulin, you can barely see anything's happening. With berberine, there's some phosphorylation, but you see a very nice synergy between insulin and berberine. Very low-dose insulin in the presence of berberine is just as physiologically active as would be high-dose insulin. Berberine enhances insulin sensitivity and insulin signaling. So we've talked about the physiology through which berberine works. Now let's present another clinical trial showing beneficial effects of, bar of berberine in adults with type 2 diabetes. 97 adults with type 2 diabetes, fasting sugar above 125, post-meal glucose around 200 or above. You're going to stop all their prior drug treatments two weeks before the study, do baseline measurements, randomize them to receive over eight weeks berberine, 500 mg twice daily, metformin, 750 mg twice daily, metformin, like berberine, will upregulate AMP sensitive protein kinase activity and will improve insulin sensitivity. Rosiclidazone, this is a thiazolidine dione, the trade name is Actose, and they are insulin sensitizers. They work by transferring fat from muscle into belly fat. If we have less fat in our muscle, we have better insulin sensitivity and our blood sugar will fall. The downside is we'll gain belly fat. So we have berberine, metformin, and actose, a thiazolidine diome. And we're going to repeat the measurements at eight weeks. And what you see in human white cells, here's baseline. Um, you can see they have a high sugar and it falls with berberine and we see greater expression of the insulin receptor on the cell membrane of the white cells. So our, we're taking berberine orally, and every cell in the body, including the white cells as depicted here, are expressing more insulin receptors. So these are two patients you can see with berberine, blood sugar falls, insulin receptor expression increases, which is just what we want. Berberine, metformin, and the thiazolidine dione, actose, were all effective in lowering fasting sugar, lowering hemoglobin A1C, and uh, berberine was the most effective of the three in lowering triglycerides. Liver chemistries were unaffected by metformin or actose, but they improved with berberine. Liver chemistries improved within the normal range, kidney chemistry stable, no adverse effects of berberine treatment. Salicylates, ICBA kinase, and glucose control. Remember, 
ligation of the toll-like receptor with bacterial cell or lipopolysaccharide or fatty acids that occur with a high-fat meal or a high-sugar meal will mimic, you know, high-sugar, high-fat diet, any sort of inflammation mimics chronic infection. We're going to activate Queen Jadis. She's going to shoot nuclear factor kappa beta in the nucleus to make bullets. And she also will promote serine phosphorylation of the insulin receptor and all the downstream um, enzymes causing insulin resistance. And we, we can block this with berberine. We can block it with aspirin. Now, in 1900, high-dose sodium salicylate, essentially aspirin, was used in the treatment of diabetes. Doctors didn't understand how aspirin worked, but it did work, so diabetics were treated with high-dose aspirin. Um, then it kind of fell out of favor as we learned that diabetes was due to insulin deficiency. And when I trained, we didn't understand the concept of insulin insensitivity. We didn't understand that type 2 diabetes existed. We felt that all diabetes was due to lack of insulin. So the treatment was insulin or drugs to stimulate the pancreas to release more insulin. Now a patient, the case report in 1950, a diabetic patient was admitted with rheumatic fever and you would treat rheumatic fever with high doses of aspirin. And Dr. Poling was actually involved in the care of this patient. So you got this type 2 diabetic with high sugar, comes in with rheumatic fever, and there's some inflammation, the sugar should get worse. They treat him with aspirin and sugar fell. So we're showing that aspirin is helping with sugar control. And there was a lot of interest here at the time, so they looked at the effect of aspirin in increasing insulin levels, and it didn't. And so we lost interest in aspirin anti-inflammatory therapy in the treatment of diabetes because we didn't understand about insulin insensitivity. Now, aspirin, acetylsalicylic acid, will reversibly acetylate and inactivate cyclooxygenase. Cyclooxygenase converts essential fatty acids, such as arachidonic acid from meat and dairy, into inflammatory enzymes, such as um, um, leukotrienes and thromboxanes and matrix metalloproteinases. It increases blood clotting. And so we will take aspirin to provide an antiplatelet effect. Um, however, Mother Nature didn't give us cyclooxygenase um, simply to cause heart disease. It's, it's a normal aspect of our physiology, so if we knock it out with aspirin, we're going to get GI tract and renal side effects. Now, salicylate lacks an acetyl group, so it will not inactivate cyclooxygenase, but it still is effective in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And this is because all salicylates, salicylate and aspirin, will inactivate queen jadis, ichpokinase. Animals that are genetically abnormal and they're heterozygotes, um, half of their ichpokinase proteins don't work, they have protection against insulin resistance. Queen jadis, ichpokinase, not, not only is she the mediator and amplifier of inflammation oxidative stress, she's the mediator of insulin resistance. And we can block her with aspirin and salicylates and berberine and blunt insulin in insensitivity. So we're going to take 20 non-diabetic obese young adults. They're all overweight. They're obese. They're young. Measure uh, baseline measures of insulin sensitivity and inflammation. Randomize them to receive salicylate two grams twice a day or placebo. Repeat the baseline measurements at four weeks. Double blind protocols followed. Now, sugar rose a little bit with placebo therapy. It fell with salicylate. Insulin sensitivity improved. Adiponectin, which rises when you're losing weight, um, increased. Free fatty acids fell. C reactive protein fell a little bit in, with in both groups, but it fell more with salicylate. Because we're blocking queen jadis, we're going to block generation of inflammatory mediators. Another study of berberine and ichpokinase queen jadis expression. We're going to take three T3 L1 preadipocytes. These are fat cells that are commercially available that are used in cell culture studies. We're going to incubate, incubate them with palmic acid. That is the saturated fatty acid and saturated fatty acids cause insulin resistance. Saturated fatty acids look to the toll-like receptor like bacterial cell wall lipopolysaccharide. Queen Jadis will be activated. Nuclear factor kappa beta will be shut into the nucleus. We're going to make 
Th1 cytokines and inflammatory mediators. Fatty acids and infection, perceived or real, leads to oxidative stress, hyperlipidemia, endothelial dysfunction, insulin resistance. So we're in this experimental model of free fatty acid-induced insulin resistance. We're going to culture the cells with lower high-dose berberine or aspirin and evaluate effects on insulin signaling. Now, first of all, glucose uptake into the cell across the cell membrane will rise with insulin, and this is blocked by saturated fatty acids. The deleterious effects of, of fatty acids on insulin sensitivity are blunted with berberine. Insulin sensit sensitivity is blocked by saturated fatty acids. This saturated fatty acid-induced insulin insensitivity is ameliorated by both berberine and by aspirin because they're both blocking clean jadis. Insulin receptor substrate expression is decreased with saturated fatty acids. So we have less insulin receptor activity and downstream signaling, and that is blunted by berberine and particularly by aspirin. Um, aspirin was most effective at 24 hours. Berberine was more effective long term. Why? Aspirin works quickly by inhibiting uh, Queen Jadis. Berberine will inhibit Queen Jadis, but it will also increase generation of insulin receptors. So it's more effective than aspirin alone. PI3K expression. This would be beneficial tyrosine phosphorylation, a good, a good guy pathway is blocked by saturated fats, and this is ameliorated by berberine or aspirin. Insulin receptor substrate serine phosphorylation, this is inactivation of the insulin signaling pathway by Queen Jadis and her inflammatory um, minions. Is, it's upregulated by saturated fatty acids. Berberine and aspirin provide protection. How is this all working? Aspirin and berberine are inhibiting Queen Jadis, we're keeping nuclear factor kappa beta out of the nucleus. We're blocking activation, phosphorylation of queen jadis, and we're blocking, we are blocking translocation of nuclear factor kappa beta from the cytoplasm where it's held in abeyance into the nucleus where it codes for inflammatory and oxidative stress mediators and molecules that cause insulin insensitivity. So here we're going to look at nuclear factor kappa beta in the cytoplasm. Here, we stain for the nucleus. We look for overlap. There's not much translocation under basal conditions. With saturated fatty acids, there's, there's more uh, discoloration because we're moving nuclear factor kappa beta from the cytoplasm of the nucleus. This is blunted by aspirin and, and or uh, by berberine. Another study of berberine and saturated fatty acid-induced insulin resistance. Take our hep G2 cells and tissue culture. We're going to pretreat for 30 minutes with salicylic acid, that's aspirin, blocks activation of queen jadis, ICPA kinase, blunts translocation of nuclear factor kappa in the nucleus, or berberine at increasing doses. Then we're going to incubate with saturated fatty acids, palmic acid, to cause insulin resistance. Then we're going to treat these cells with insulin for three hours. Now, insulin will activate the insulin receptor and initiate tyrosine phosphorylation of downstream enzymes and markers of insulin signaling intact insulin function would be increased glycogen synthesis, decreased triglyceride synthesis, decreased lipolysis, decreased breakdown of fat and raising fatty acids of the blood. What effect will saturated fat, fatty acids plus or minus berberine or aspirin have on these markers of insulin sensitivity or conversely insulin insensitivity. Now this is glycogen. If we have more glucose in our cells than we need, we can store this as glycogen, a ready release form of sugar. This is promoted by insulin signaling. We want a lot of glycogen in our livers and in our muscles. Now, I run a marathon once a year and we're supposed to engage in carbohydrate loading a few days before the marathon. And the idea is if we carbohydrate load, we'll have more glycogen in our muscles and liver, we'll be able to run farther. I don't know if it works that well, and personally I favor a steak and two Heineken's the night before a marathon, but don't tell anybody that. But anyways, we wanna see high levels of glycogen in our cells um, with, and they rise with insulin. However, insulin and saturated fatty acids, we have insulin insensitivity, less glycogen. This is ameliorated by berberine and aspirin. 
if we are not going to be burning sugar, if we're not going to be storing it as glycogen, we may convert it into saturated fatty acids and put fatty acids together with glycerol and make triglyceride. This would be a marker of insulin insensitivity. And so we see more fatty acid and triglyceride generation um, with saturated fats. So it's blunting insulin sensitivity. And this is ameliorated by berberine and aspirin. So these negative consequences of saturated fatty acids producing insulin insensitivity and compromising in uh, insulin signaling within the cell, a uh, decrease in glycogen, increase in fatty acids, increase in triglycerides is blunted by berberine and by aspirin because they're keeping uh, Queen Jadis from activating. Berberine and saturated fatty acid induced insulin resistance. We're going to take Hep G2 cells in tissue culture, pre-treat over 30 minutes with aspirin to block nuclear factor kappa beta, berberine at increasing doses, incubate with the saturated fatty acid for 24 hours, and we're going to measure Th1 cytokine generation. Saturated fatty acids ligate the toll-like receptor, activates queen jadis, nuclear factor kappa goes to the nucleus. We're going to make interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. What effect will berberine and aspirin have? You can see with saturated fat, we're going to get more interleukin-6, more tumor necrosis factor alpha. This is blunted by berberine and aspirin, particularly aspirin for IL-6, and aspirin is more effective than berberine with TNF-alpha. Hep G2 cells in tissue culture, we're going to evaluate insulin-mediated glycogen synthesis, which is an anabolic action of insulin. We should see this if insulin is working well, following treatment with a saturated fatty acid, palmitic acid, palmitic acid plus an antibody that will neutralize interleukin-6 or an antibody to neutralize tumor necrosis factor alpha, you can see that insulin signaling here manifested by glycogen synthesis is blunted by the saturated fatty acid. But if we knock out IL-6 and TNF-alpha, um, the saturated fatty acid will have less of an effect on insulin signaling because fatty acids work through this pathway nuclear factor kappa beta codes for these cytokines, they mediate much of the insulin insensitivity of high fatty acids. We knock them out. We don't have as much insulin sensitivity. This is just showing how the pathways work. If we evaluate serine phosphorylation inactivation of the insulin receptor substrate, we see this increases with saturated fatty acids, and this is prevented. It's blunted by berberine or, or uh, aspirin. Beneficial tyrosine phosphorylation activation of the insulin receptor substrate 1 is blocked by saturated fatty acids. This is ameliorated by berberine and aspirin and by Bay, which is an experimental uh, substance that knocks out nuclear factor kappa beta. So if we knock out queen jadis, we knock out nuclear factor kappa beta with Bay, with aspirin, with berberine, we are going to blunt insulin insensitivity due to any source of inflammation, lipopolysaccharide or here, high levels of saturated fatty acids. Insulin-mediated AKT activation, tyrosine phosphorylation, normal insulin signaling is blunted by saturated fatty acids, and this is ameliorated by berberine or aspirin or by knocking out nuclear factor kappa beta. So there's a battle going on in every cell in your body for control of insulin signaling. If we have beneficial tyrosine phosphorylation because we exercise, because we're trim, or because we take berberine, we're going to get tyrosine phosphorylation, more insulin receptors, greater integrity of, the, of, of all the enzymes that are involved in insulin signaling and anabolic function. Conversely, if we have inflammation, cytokines, and oxidative stress because our body thinks we're fighting an infection, we get an equal and opposite serine phosphorylation that mediates insulin insensitivity. Great when you're fighting a real infection, but not so great when you're a type 2 diabetic. And we can rectify this with lifestyle change and with berberine and other substances that upregulate AMP sensitive protein kinase. So let's now compare berberine versus the prescription agent metformin in new onset uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. 36 subjects with newly diagnosed and not yet treated type 2 diabetes. Hemoglobin A1C is above 7. It should be 
you know, below 6 or below 5.5. Fasting sugars above 125. Ideally, we want our sugar below 85. Our upper limit of normal is 100, but ideal is 85. Body mass index is not ideal. They're above 22. Two months of dietary change, baseline measurements, randomize them to receive berberine, 500 milligrams three times a day after a meal or placebo. You're going to repeat the baseline measurements at 13 weeks. Three of the berberine subjects and two of the placebo subjects dropped out due to persistent hyperglycemia and they were put on open drug therapy. Of those who continued the study, you can see that metformin was effective. It lowered fasting sugar and post-meal sugar and so did berberine. Here if we look at fasting sugar, it drops from 178 to 128 with metformin, 190 to 120 with berberine, post-prandial, post-meal glucose falls with both groups. So here, metformin and berberine are equally effective. Hemoglobin A1C drops with both groups. Fasting insulin drops with both groups. Just what we want to see. HDL cholesterol goes up a little bit with metformin. It drops a little bit with berberine. The only negative of berberine is it tends to lower the HDL. Berberine did a better job um, on LDL, a much better job on triglycerides and on cholesterol. Now, let's look at berberine and gene expression. The deep magic of Narnia is understanding the forces that cause evil to exist. The deep magic of, of human physiology is to understand our DNA and how we can change the way our body reads DNA. If we keep nuclear factor kappa beta and activator protein 1 out of the nucleus and we put NERF 2 into the nucleus, we're going to change the way we read our DNA to have less inflammation, less oxidative stress, better detoxification function. So let's look at berberine and gene expression in KKAY. These are genetically obese type 2 diabetic mice. We're going to put them on a bad diet, so they're genetically predisposed to type 2 diabetes. We're going to put them on a bad diet, high fat, high carb. Treat them over four weeks with Ig, intragastric berberine or vehicle. Monitor parameters related to diabetes and obesity. And then we're going to look at skeletal muscle gene expression. Fasting sugar rises with vehicle with control treatment. It falls with berberine. HOMA, which is insulin insensitivity index, improves with berberine. Cholesterol and triglycerides fall as you would expect. And we change the way the DNA is read. Uncoupling protein wastes energy and promotes weight control and decreases free radical stress. We want a lot of uncoupling protein. It is increased with berberine. Resistant promotes insulin resistance. It's decreased with berberine. Berberine changes our, the way we read our DNA. We're making more AMP sensor protein kinase. Fasting sugar improves. We're changing the way we're activating. This is ERK-1-2, so we're going to make more LDL receptors. We're changing the reading we're, we're making different transcription factors, all designed to lower our lipids. So the way we read our DNA is changed with berberine in a fashion that decreases the generation of free radicals, lowers sugar, lowers lipids. Berberine and PPAR activation. PPARs are transcription factors that translocate into the nucleus and read the DNA in differential fashion to, that affects our physiology. We're going to take genetically normal rats and we're going to make them diabetic. We're going to give them streptosidocin. This is a toxin to the pancreas. So we're going to knock out the pancreas so it can't make insulin, put them on a standard diet in water. For two weeks, they're all going to be hyperglycemic. We've created type 1 diabetes. Then we're going to create a diabetic hyperlipidemic physiology by giving them a high cholesterol, high fat diet. So they're diabetic and hyperlipidemic. After 16 weeks of this, we're going to treat the diabetic hyperlipidemic rats with berberine, phenylfibrate. This is a prescription drug. Tricor is the trade name. It is a PPAR alpha agonist or rosiglazone, which is a thiazolidine diome. It's a PPAR gamma agonist. Evaluate effects on glucolipid values, liver histology, and PPAR status at 32 weeks. Now, this is a bit complicated, I will admit. However, the more we know about our physiology, the better. PPAR alpha is found in the liver. It promotes fatty acid oxidation. That's a good thing. It is underrepresented in the diabetic liver. PPAR delta is found in skeletal muscle and adipose tissue, muscle and fat. It also promotes fatty acid oxidation. That's a good thing. It is 
downregulated in the diabetic liver. PPAR gamma is primarily found in adipose tissue where it promotes lipid uptake and lipogenesis, and it is upregulated in the diabetic liver. Now, body weight. The control animals are, have a healthy weight. They gain weight between weights between weeks 16 and, and 32. The diabetic rats are stunted. Their weight is low, and over 16 weeks they will gain weight, but it's mostly fat because they're hyperlipidemic type 2 diabetic rats. But as you can see, if you go from low intermediate to high dose berberine, weight gain is blunted. Phenylfibrate, the PPAR alpha agonist that promotes fatty acid oxidation, also blunts weight gain. The thiazolidinedione, actose, does not. Weight gain over 16 weeks is blunted by high dose berberine and phenylfibrate, but not by actose. Liver weight rises with diabetes. They have fatty liver. And fatty liver is blunted by high-dose berberine. It's blunted by phenylfibrate, the PPAR alpha agonist. But, but fatty liver is not affected favorably by um, actose, the thiazolidinedione. Change in LDL. It rises with diabetes. And this is blunted with berberine. It's blunted with phenylfibrate. The thiazolidinedione has no effect. Triglycerides are, are lowered with berberine and the PPAR alpha agonist phenofibrate, but not by the PPAR gamma agonist actose. In terms of blood sugar, actose was most effective in lowering blood sugar. Then, was, then you see high-dose berberine. Low-dose berberine, placebo therapy, and tricor phenofibrate had no effect. Change in hemoglobin A1c, it falls with high-dose berberine. It falls with actose. It doesn't fall much with phenylfibrate. But you can see that berberine combines the beneficial clinical effects of phenylfibrate and actose. Now, here we're going to look at the liver. This is a healthy liver. This is the diabetic liver. It doesn't look so good. These holes are actually areas full of fat. As you increase the dose of berberine, the liver looks better. Phenylfibrate improves the appearance of the liver. The thiazolidinedione does not. It actually promotes fatty liver. If we look at glycogen storage and index of insulin sensitivity, it's not looking so good in the diabetic liver. Berberine helps, um, as does the thiazolidinedione. If we look, here we have glycogen and here we have fatty acids. So here we have the diabetic liver. It's not looking so good. Berberine improves its appearance. Tricor, the PPAR alpha agonist, improves the appearance. Actose, the thiazolidinedione, does not. It actually increases fat deposition in the liver. PPAR alpha and PPAR gamma are working differentially. PPAR alpha is decreased in the diabetic rat, and we increase it with berberine or phenylfibrate, but not by the thiazolidinedione. PPAR gamma is overexpressed in the diabetic liver and it is decreased with berberine and by um, the thiazolidinedione, but not by phenylfibrate. PPAR delta acts an awful lot like PPAR alpha in burning fatty acids. So to summarize here, PPAR alpha, PPAR delta, they help you burn fat, which is a good thing. They're decreased in the diabetic liver. They're increased with berberine. They're increased with phenylfibrate. The actose molecule does not have an effect PPAR gamma that promotes lipid uptake and lipogenesis is increased in the diabetic liver. It's decreased with berberine. Phenylfibrate has no effect, but an actose will lower it. So you can see that berberine provides the beneficial effects of thiazolidinedione and phenylfibrate therapy. Um, so it's like taking two drugs at once. Now let's look at berberine and adipose cell. That's fat cell differentiation. We're going to take human omental preadipocytes, nine adults who did not have endocrine or inflammatory conditions. They're undergoing hernia repair, so they take a little bit of fat from the omentum. That's the layer of fat in, in our abdomens. And we're going to take these preadipocytes and grow them in tissue culture. And as they mature, as they grow, their morphology changes from the spindle shape of the preadipocyte to a mature adipocyte to a mature adipocyte containing droplets of fat. And we're going to incubate these adipocytes with berberine at increasing doses and see what effect berberine has on 
adipocyte maturation and proliferation of these fat, fat stored cells. And in response to berberine, you see an increased rate of growth of the adipocytes. And this is what you want. You want to have a large number of small adipocytes. And that is the effect that berberine has. The adipocytes, their differentiation, their maturation is delayed. And we want that. The mature adipocytes are more hormonally active. They're more likely to make inflammatory mediators. So with berberine, we have a larger number of small and relatively immature and metabolically inactive fat cells. And if we look at the release of inflammatory mediators from the, these adipocytes, that is also blunted by berberine. So with berberine, the fat cells do what they're supposed to do, store energy for periods of caloric deprivation. They don't enlarge and become metabolically active and release inflammatory mediators, which is a property we do not want. Berberine and fatty liver. We're going to take genetically abnormal mice their leptin receptors are dysfunctional. So these mice are going to be obese and diabetic. We're going to put them on standard housing, chow, and water. Baseline measurements at nine weeks of age. We're going to begin daily IP, intraperitoneal, into the belly cavity administration of berberine or vehicle. We're going to sacrifice the, the mice at 12 weeks and, and evaluate um, them. And here's what you see. These genetically diabetic mice will gain weight on their standard chow, standard chow with berberine, they actually lose weight. Food intake is the same. So if food intake is the same, but you're losing weight with berberine, it's because your metabolic rate is increased. Respiratory quotient falls. That means you're burning fat as opposed to sugar. You're, you're wasting energy. You're going through more energy per day. You're becoming fuel inefficient which is a good thing if you're an overweight, diabetic mouse or human. So your metabolism is increasing with berberine, thus without a change in caloric intake, you lose weight. Serum lipids fall with berberine. Hepatic lipids, lipids, cholesterol and triglycerides within the liver itself also fall. Liver chemistries fall and the liver weight decreases. You have less fatty liver. We call this hepatic steatosis. If we stain for fat within the liver, this is blunted with berberine, less fatty liver. AMP-sensitive protein kinase, AMPK, increases fatty acid oxidation, and it's activated via phosphorylation, and in the liver of these animals, you can see that berberine upregulates activation of AMPK, as we would expect. Acetyl-CoA carboxylase, ACC, inhibits fatty acid oxidation, so you're going to have more fatty liver. AMPK inactivates ACC via phosphorylation, so berberine activates AMPK and it phosphorylates ACC, downregulating it, so we burn more fatty acids, we build fewer fatty acids and triglycerides. So in the fatty liver, we're going to activate AMPK, we're going to inactivate ACC carbolase, we're going to burn more fatty acids. Now, if we look at the way we read our DNA, Enzymes that are involved in burning fat, like uncoupling protein or carnitine palmitoyl transferase, are increased. Enzymes that mediate lipogenesis, making cholesterol and triglycerides and increasing the size of fat cells, are decreased. So we're going to burn more fat. We're going to have less fat accumulation within the liver. We're going to make less cholesterol, make less triglycerides. Pro-inflammatory genes, the work product of, of tumor necrosis, of the work product of nuclear factor kappa beta, TNF, IL-6, are blunted. So we're going to decrease the reading of these inflammatory mediators um, from our DNA. Now, this we talked about fatty liver. If we look at muscle, we see the same thing. We have activation of AMPK in the muscle. We have inactivation of ACC in the muscle and enzymes that mediate fatty acid burning in our muscle are upregulated. So we become more efficient at burning fatty acids in our muscle. That will lower fat within the muscle. That'll improve uh, insulin sensitivity. Now, this is the really cool part. Berberine in brain to muscle signaling. 
you're going to inject berberine into the cerebral spinal fluid. This is like if we did a lumbar puncture and infused berberine into your spinal fluid and then shook you up and down. So a lot of that berberine got to the level of the hypothalamus. Hypothalamic AMPK and ACC levels will be affected by berberine. The hypothalamus will send a signal to fat and muscle via the autonomic nervous system. So we're going to put berberine into the hypothalamus and it's going to tell the muscles to change the way they read their DNA in such a fashion that you burn fatty acids and you make less lipids. That's pretty cool how the brain can influence metabolism in the liver, fatty acids, and muscles. So we've talked more about how berberine works. Let's look at the effect of berberine add-on therapy in adults with poorly controlled type 2 diabetes. 48 subjects who, despite medical therapy, their sugar is not under good control. The A1C is above 7, fasting sugar is above 125. None of them were trim. They're all on diet and some form of medical therapy, but it's not working. Do baseline measurements on diet and medical therapy. You're going to add berberine, 1,500 milligrams a day, same diet, medical therapy, and exercise. Repeat the baseline measurements over 13 weeks. And you can see that fasting sugar and postprandial sugar falls when berberine is added to preexistent medical therapy. Fasting sugar falls at five weeks and it remains low at 13 weeks. Postprandial, post-meal sugar falls at five weeks. It falls further at 13 weeks. Hemolyt A1C drops, insulin levels drop, LDL drops, triglycerides drop. Body mass index is unaffected, but your waist circumference is less. So you're making muscle and you're losing belly fat, insulin insensitivity is attenuated. Um, fasting C peptide. One of the prob with type 2 diabetes, the problem is not lack of insulin, it's poor insulin sensitivity. So, so the pancreas responds by cranking out a whole lot of insulin. And if it makes a whole lot of insulin, it can keep things in balance. But eventually the pancreas gets tired, it gets fatigued, it can't make enough insulin to keep up. Um, and one measurement of that is C-peptide. But with berberine, the pancreas is sort of rested. There's an anti-inflammatory therapy, so the ability of the a pancreas to generate insulin is manifested by C-peptide will be increased with berberine therapy. So berberine add-on therapy in poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, no change in kidney chemistries or liver chemistries, muscle enzyme, the CPK does not rise as it might with statin therapy. GI side effects were greater in this group, 34%. Now, in untreated individuals, GI tract side effects are 5%, but these people are already on a bunch of drugs that could affect the GI tract, so 34% had a GI uh, side effect. And what you do then is you decrease the dose and all the symptoms, all the side effects of berberine will go away because they're dose related. No dropouts due to the nuisance side effects. You can attenuate the side effects simply by decreasing the dose. All right, what about individuals that have viral hepatitis and diabetes? We're reluctant to treat them with our standard drugs because our standard drugs are toxic to the liver and their liver is inflamed. 35 subs with viral hepatitis complicated by type 2 diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. 18 with hepatitis C, 17 with hepatitis B, treat them all with berberine, 500 mg twice daily for two months, and you see in the hepatitis C and the hepatitis B patients, fasting glucose improves, just as it does in individuals with normal livers. Um, triglycerides fall. Liver chemistries are elevated due to fatty liver and viral hepatitis, and they improve as well. So there's no, you, you can use berberine freely in individuals with viral hepatitis. As we'll learn in the next section, berberine will protect the liver and the kidney and every cell in the body from damage due to inflammation, toxicity, oxidative stress, um, oxygen deficiency, and it will protect the liver from fatty liver, from type 2 diabetes, or from the deleterious effects of viral hepatitis. Now let's look at the berberine effect on gut microbiota in high fat diet uh, fed rats. Now we all now appreciate that we live in a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria in our gut. And over the last three million years, we've had a certain mix of bacteria in the gut, and we depend upon them for, for, um, for metabolism of, uh, of the, the foodstuffs that we take in and to protect us from uh, bacterial infection. So 
the mix of bacteria in our gut has been altered by all the antibiotics in the foods that we eat. And this is why nearly all of us are taking probiotics to restore the normal gut microbiota. What effect will berberine have on the mix of bacteria in the gut and how will that affect insulin sensitivity, insulin signaling? We're gonna take 48 week old male Wistar genetically normal rats, do baseline measurements, divide them into four feeding groups. One group gets normal um, uh, rat chow with 10% fat, another group gets normal chow with berberine, a third group gets a 60% high fat chow diet, the fourth group gets the bad high fat diet plus berberine, repeat the baseline measurements at 18 at weeks. Now, weight gain was greatest with the high fat diet. And then here we have high fat diet with berberine. Weight gain due to the high fat diet was blunted and similar to, individual, to the animals on the normal diet. The lowest weight were, in, were the animals on a normal diet with berberine. So berberine will blunt weight gain especially weight gain in response to a high fat diet. Here's food intake, and there was a little decrease in food intake with berberine. That's the hypothalamic effect, but basically food intake was not blunted significantly, but weight gain was. Why? Because berberine promotes the burning of fat. So you're gonna get less weight gain on a, on a high fat diet. Adiposity index, a, a measure of fatness, increases on the high fat diet that is blended with berberine, insulin insensitivity, the HOMA index, rises on a high fat diet that's blended by berberine. Fasting glucose falls, fasting insulin falls. So all these negative effects of the high fat diet are ameliorated or blunted by berberine, in, uh, berberine therapy. Leptin rises as a measure of adiposity that is blunted with berberine. Adiponectin rises when you're lean, and it promotes insulin uh, sensitivity. It promotes endothelial function. We want a lot of adiponectin. Adiponectin is lost with a high-fat diet, and there's some amelioration with berberine. Um, Short-chain fatty acids, such as acetic acid and propionic acid, is food for the enterocytes, the cells that line the gut. We want a lot of short chain fatty acids to maintain the integrity of the small bowel. We want butyric acid to maintain the integrity of the large bowel. You could see on the high fat diet, we lose short chain fatty acids and butyric acid. And this is why a high fat or a high sugar diet, which becomes a high fat physiology causes leaky gut. When our gut is not working, the, the cells are not healthy undigested molecules um, or bacteria will translocate across the gut wall and enter the circulation. And this would be favored by a high fat diet. And you can see that berberine provides some protection. So berberine will, will change the mix of saturated fatty acids and butyric acid um, in the gut that was otherwise compromised by a high fat diet. Serum lipopolysaccharide binding protein, which is a marker of translocation of bacteria from the gut across the gut wall into the circulation, we don't want that. That rises with a high fat diet that's blended with berberine. Monocyte chemotractant, that is a inflammatory cytokine, another marker of leaky gut. It rises with a high fat diet, it's blended with berberine. Whenever we have a bad meal, we're gonna get gut inflammation and bacteria will translocate across the gut wall into the circulation. If we're chronically eating a bad diet, high sugar, high fat, if we're taking antibiotics and, and disrupting our normal flora, we're gonna have chronic leaky gut, chronic inflammation, berberine will blunt this. So here we're gonna look at the, the change in the gut flora in response to a high fat diet from a normal diet and the effects of berberine, and berberine is moving us in the right direction. Um, Another study of four-week-old genetically normal mice do baseline measurements, divide them into four feeding groups. Normal chow, high-fat chow with berberine, high-fat chow with rhizomacoptitis. And this is the actual herb from which berberine is extracted. Repeat baseline measurements over six weeks. And you'll see with the high-fat diet, the rats gain a lot of weight. Um, but that, and here are the normal rats. Here we have high-fat diet 
fed diet rats with rhizoma and berberine. So weight gain due to the high fat diet is blunted by rhizoma or berberine. If we look at the amount of visceral adipose tissue and index of adiposity, it rises in the high fat diet. It does not rise with high fat diet plus berberine or rhizoma. Caloric intake was blunted slightly by berberine, but not a whole lot. Fecal excretion is less on a high fat diet because you have less fiber, and it was increased with berberine or rhizoma. Fecal triglycerides rise on a high fat diet. If you take a lot of fat, you can absorb it. So some goes out in the stool, but not a whole lot. This didn't really, it, this was blooded slightly by berberine, but didn't really explain the change in weight. Fecal polysaccharides rises with berberine and rhizoma. Berberine and rhizoma will block the assimilation of energy from dietary carbohydrate. So it's not going into your body, it's going out in the stool. And this will help blunt weight gain on a high fat diet or any diet for that matter. Now, if we look at the composition of bacteria in the gut, um, that we have families of bacteria such as Bacteroides and Vermiculites, and they are decreased with berberine and rhizoma. Um, we see fewer aerobic and anaerobic bacteria in the gut. Berberine and rhizoma have been used in, in Chinese medicine to treat bacterial infections of the gut. And because they have an antimicrobial effect, they are altering the gut flora to prevent infection of the gut and to have a favorable effect on metabolism, lowering sugar, lowering uh, uh, fatty acid uptake, lowering inflammation. Theof is fasting-induced adipocyte adipose factor, which promotes burning of fatty acids and improving insulin sensitivity and blunting obesity. It is decreased with a high-fat diet. High-fat diet with berberine and rhizoma, it's restored. It's actually amplified. If we look at their visceral fat, their visceral adipose tissue, and look at um, transcription of genes, we can see that in response to a high-fat diet, we see caloric intake and carbohydrate absorption increases, and enzymes that are involved in lipogenesis and insulin resistance are increased. However, with, if we add berberine and rhizoma to the high-fat diet, we see decreased carbohydrate assimilation with reduced lipogenesis, less fat generation. We change the, the mixture of bacteria in the gut to increase the FIOF factor. We increase the generation of mitochondria and fatty acid burning enzymes, all favorable effects. Barberry is a plant indigenous to the Middle East. And this is a subject done on, in Iran, 47 subjects with type 2 diabetes. They've been diabetic for about five years. You do baseline studies, continue the usual diet and medical regimen, randomize them to receive placebo or um, berberis vulgaris fruit extract. And you evaluate the response over three months, double-blind protocol followed. Now, berberis vulgaris is the fruit of a shrub that is indigenous to the Middle East. And it's the barberry is the fruit of the shrub, and it's used widely in Iranian cooking. And the berberine content is five to seven percent. So this dose would be about 150 to 210 milligrams per day of berberine. Now they looked at caloric intake. There was no difference in energy intake, no difference in fat intake. The control subjects gained weight, the barberry subjects lost weight. There was no change in energy intake, but barberry activates AMP sensor protein kinase, you burn more fat, and of course you're gonna lose weight. LDL cholesterol fell, triglycerides fell. ApoB, this is the protein of LDL. When we're talking about your LDL particle number, we're measuring the number of ApoB proteins, it falls. ApoA is the protein of HDL. The ratio of ApoB to ApoA rose with diabetes that was untreated, it fell with barberry which is the, the plant that contains berberine. Triglyc the triglyceride to HDL ratio fell, the ApoB to ApoA ratio fell, and this would correlate with the decrease in small dense LDL. Now LDL, when it, when it is oxidized or when it is incorporated into the cells due to inflammation, leads to atherosclerosis. The greater the number of LDL particles floating around, the greater is your risk. The smaller the particle, the more dangerous they are because it's easier for the smaller particles to enter the artery wall. Berberine not only lowers the LDL and the LDL particle number, 
you have fewer small, dense, atherogenic LDL, more large LDL that's less likely to wiggle into the artery wall. Fasting glucose falls, hemolyte A1C falls a little bit more with berberine therapy or barberry therapy. Fasting insulin falls, the insulin insensitivity index falls. They also recorded dietary intake of antioxidants, such as vitamin C and vitamin A. There was no difference between the two groups. But total antioxidant capacity of the serum was enhanced with barberry. So they're not taking in more antioxidants, but their body is making more antioxidant enzyme systems. This is because berberine causes NERF2 to translocate into the nucleus and help make antioxidant and detoxification um, defense enzymes. We'll talk about that more in the next section. Okay, so our slay masker here has been eating too much Turkish Delight, and he's an overweight type 2 diabetic. And one of the, the, we don't really want to just lower your sugar. We want to protect you from the end organ consequences of hyperglycemia. Now, berberine, not only will it lower sugar, it lowers inflammation. It has an antioxidant function. It lowers the rate at which cells proliferate. It blocks aldose reductase, which is involved in converting glucose into sorbitol that causes cell swelling. It protects against oxidative and toxic apoptosis. More about that in the next section. So we would predict that bourbon would pr be protective against diabetic kidney disease, that's nephropathy, diabetic eye disease, retinopathy, diabetic cardiomyopathy, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and PCOS, polycystic um, ovarian syndrome, which we'll talk about in a moment. Let's look at berberine in diabetic kidney protection. 40 male Wistar genetically normal rats, 10 are control rat standard diet, 15 rats are rendered diabetic. You give them streptosidocin, which is going to damage their pancreas. Um, they will become uh, type 1 diabetics. They cannot make insulin. The berberine rats are rendered diabetic, but they're also fed berberine all receive usual chow water and housing, sacrifice saw and evaluate kidney status for 12 weeks. Fasting glucose rises with the diabetic, with, with type 1 diabetes as you would expect. The type 1 diabetic rats treated with berberine, sugars lower. Body weight is, is, they lose weight because they're hyperglycemic. All the sugars going out through the kidney, they become thin and scrawny. That is ameliorated with berberine. The kidneys enlarge. The glomerular area, which is the vasculature of the kidney, enlarges. Um, this has to do with cell swelling. It's deleterious. So we have enlargement of the kidney, enlargement of the, of the renal vasculature, which is deleterious. This is blunted by berberine. Serum creatinine which is a measure of kidney function. Your muscles are making creatinine at a constant rate. It's removed from the body through the kidney. If your kidneys are not functioning well, we say your B1 and creatinine are elevated. The creatinine rises with type 1 diabetes. The type 1 diabetic um, animals that are treated with berberine, creatinine does not rise as much. There's less spillage of protein in the urine, a marker of diabetic nephropathy. Superoxide dismutase, which is our key antioxidant. NADPH oxidase makes superoxide a damaging free radical. Mother Nature gave us superoxide dismutase to neutralize it. We lose superoxide dismutase in the diabetic um, kidney, and we were, so our ability to neutralize free radicals falls. This is a 10 with berberine, so we're going to get more lipid oxidation. We see higher levels of malandialdehyde. Aldose reductase transcription and protein expression is increased. That converts glucose into sorbitol that causes cellular swelling. This is upregulated in type 1 diabetes and hyperglycemia, and it's ameliorated with berberine. Now, so we've covered diabetic nephropathy. Now let's talk about diabetic eye disease, diabetic retinopathy. We're going to take HREX, human retinal endothelial cells. These are cells that line the blood vessels of the retina. We're going to place them in tissue culture with white cells from diabetic and non-diabetic humans under physiologic or pathologically hyperglycemic conditions for two days with or without various experimental manipulations. And we're going to look at the effect of the white cells and the different differential sugar levels on apoptosis, cell suicide of these retinal endothelial cells, the mechanism of apoptosis, and adhesion markers. 
Now, if we're looking at up here is apoptosis, the cells have given up, they've committed suicide. If these cells are exposed to normal glucose and white cells from non-diabetic individuals, there's not much apoptosis. These are healthy conditions. If we expose them to high sugar, again with white cells from non-diabetics, the high sugar is damaging, we get a little bit of apoptosis. If we take white cells from diabetics that, are, that have been affected by diabetes in low glucose conditions, there's some toxicity, but a double whammy would be to expose these endothelial cells to high sugar and white cells from diabetics, we're gonna knock off 28% of the cells. So high sugar and white cells from diabetic individuals are toxic to the, the cells that line the artery. Similar to a prior study in our last section, we showed that oxidized LDL is toxic to the endothelial cells lining our arteries. Here we're seeing that hyperglycemia, white cells from diabetics are toxic to the cells that line the arteries in the eye. Okay, now what we're gonna do, we're gonna put in a, a mesh, a transwell, that will sequester the white cells away from the, um, the endothelial cells. So we see low glucose uh, white cells from non-diabetics. That's not a toxic situation. High sugar is toxic. If we sequester the white cells from diabetics away from the endothelial cells, there's no toxicity. Um, so that's telling us for the diabetic white cells to damage the endothelial cells that line the arteries, there has to be cell-to-cell -cell contact. And that, they will damage the cells, but if you keep them apart, there's, there's no damage. Now, so here we're gonna incubate the endothelial cells with white cells from diabetics under high glucose conditions. We're gonna have a high level of apoptosis. If we block ICAM or CD18, we will blunt this. ICAM is an adhesion molecule elaborated by the endothelial cells. This is attachment site for the monocytes. CD18 is the corresponding attachment site of the monocyte for the endothelial cells. If we block cell attachment, either with the trans well or blocking these adhesion molecules, we will prevent the white cells from killing the endothelial cells. So here we've got the human retinal artery endothelial cells exposed to diabetic white cells under high glucose conditions, and we're gonna have a 27% apoptosis rate that is prevented, it's blunted by berberine in a dose-related fashion. So the toxicity of high sugar or a white cell obtained from a diabetic individual on the endothelial cells that line the vasculature of the eye is blunted by berberine. An end organ consequence of diabetes is blunted by berberine. Here we're gonna look at white cell adhesion to the endothelial cells. If these white cells are adhering to the endothelial cells, they're mediating damage. This is block, blunted by berberine. Um, if we look at CD18 expression on the diabetic white cells, those are the attachment sites so they can glue to the endothelial cells, that is blunted by berberine. If we look at the ICAM, that is the receptor on endothelial cells to which the white cells will bind, that's blocked by berberine. So berberine's keeping these diabetic white cells from binding to the cells that line the retinal arteries, which would otherwise mediate damage. And how is this all working? Because berberine is blocking phosphorylation of queen jadis, ichpokinase, and it's gonna block translocation of nuclear factor kappa beta from the cytoplasm of the nucleus. This same pathway is operative in every organ of the body. So we will see relative expression of nuclear factor kappa beta, um, translocation from the cytoplasm of the nucleus rises with hyperglycemia. This is blunted by berberine because berberine blunts the activation of queen jadis ichpokinase. If we keep her from activating, we won't let nuclear factor kappa beta go to the nucleus. We won't make bullets that will damage the cells that line our arteries and our great vessels, in our kidneys, or in our eyes. Um, if we look at malondialdehyde formation, a marker of free radical stress, this rises with hyperglycemia. This is blunted with berberine. If we look at superoxide dismutase, the same situation in the kidney, the same situation in every organ of the body, our anaxin defenses are lost with diabetes with hyperglycemia, 
and there's an amelioration with berberine. Catalyze breaks down hydrogen peroxide, just as superoxide dismutase breaks down superoxide. It is lost with diabetes. It is preserved with berberine therapy. Nitric oxide generated by the endothelial cells is beneficial. It mediates endothelial function. It's the Teflon coating. But our white cells will generate nitric oxide as bullets. So we don't want to see our white cells making nitric oxide via inducible nitric oxide synthase that's deleterious, that's upregulated by hyperglycemia, there's protection with berberine. Glutathione peroxidase recycles glutathione, our key antioxidant, that's lost with hyperglycemia, it's preserved with berberine. So we're going to take 28 subjects with insulin-treated type 2 diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. Mean age 63, they've been diabetic for 14 years, fasting sugar is 179 despite therapy. We're going to look at hemoglobin A1c, and we're going to look at how toxic their white cells are to um, endothelial cells of the retinal artery in humans. So we're going to treat them with berberine, 500 g twice a day for four weeks, and of course their hemoglobin A1c falls. The toxicity of their white cells to the endothelial cells is blunted. The white cells are making fewer ad adhesion molecules. The endothelial cells are making fewer in, um, adhesion molecules. So the toxicity of the white blood cell to the, the cells that line the retinal arteries is blunted by berberine. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is another manifestation here in young women of insulin resistance. 100 women of reproductive age with PCOS and insulin resistance. They had irregular menses or amenorrhea. They had stopped cycling. They had a hyperandrogenic physiology. They have high testosterone. Their ovaries are cystic. Thus, they call it PCOS. Do baseline studies. All subjects are randomized to receive over three months diet and exercise and ciproterone acetate ethanyl estradiol, essentially oral contraceptives. And that is the approved therapy for PCOS. And then on top of the standard therapy, you randomize them to metformin, an insulin sensitizer, berberine, which is more than just an insulin sensitizer, or placebo three times a day. And all, in all three groups, weight falls, body mass index falls, the waist to hip ratio, a measure of visceral fat uh, falls in all groups, but more in berberine, waist circumference falls in all three groups, but a little bit more with berberine. Fasting insulin falls, area under the curve of insulin, a measure of insulin intensity falls, and fasting glucose to insulin ratio falls. So berberine works as well as metformin in dealing with um, insulin insensitivity in PCOS. Testosterone levels fall. Sex hormone binding globulin that binds up testosterone rises, and that's what you want because these women have too much testosterone and their free androgen index, how much testosterone is floating around inappropriate to this condition were blunted by berberine. So the misdecision that our body makes to increase cholesterol production is a misinterpretation of the inflammatory conditions of modern Western man. Our high sugar, our high saturated fat diet producing visceral adiposity and these cells are inflammatory, environmental toxins, leaky gut, infection, allergy, gingivitis, as we turn off AMP sensor protein kinase and we upregulate HMG CoA reductase to make cholesterol, we're also going to shoot nuclear factor, we're going to activate Queen Jadis, who's going to shoot nuclear factor kappa beta in the nucleus, and we're going to make bullets, free radicals like superoxide, um, inducible nitric oxide, uh, TH1 cytokines, our cells will proliferate rapidly. The immune system fires up. Endothelial dysfunction, hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, all because we think we're fighting a chronic infection when we're not. So the decision, the mistake to upregulate cholesterol production also activates NADPH oxidase, which makes superoxide, which makes our white cells killing machines. Unfortunately, they're killing our artery walls. Um, Queen Jadis, ICPA kinase, is the mediator of inflammation amplification, and we want to block her activity with berberine, and indeed we can. Um, we know that inflammation produces dyslipidemia. It causes the liver to be a net producer and exporter of lipids into the cells that proliferate, particularly the white blood cells, mediating atherosclerosis. Um, because of inflammation, we will esterify cholesterol within our white cells, and that 
um, overcomes our, neg our negative feedback mechanism, and thus, for any given level of serum cholesterol, our white cells will engorge with cholesterol, promoting atherosclerosis. If we oxidize our LDL, they look like a microbe, and the bacteria will gob them up, and this will feed forward the inflammatory response that mediates atherosclerosis. Inflammation causes insulin insensitivity. Queen Ikba, not only does she shoot nuclear factor kappa into the nucleus, she will carry out serine phosphorylation, downregulate insulin receptor function, and downstream anabolic insulin signaling. Berberine and a, a caloric restriction and exercise will upregulate, it will phosphorylate AMP sensitive protein kinase. And this is what we want because we want low cholesterol, we want low sugar, we want to be trim, we don't want oxidative stress or, or inflammation, we want good endothelial function, we want malignant cells to commit suicide, we want to protect normal cells from toxicity, and AMP sensitive protein kinase does this, thus we want to live an AMP sensitive protein kinase lifestyle, and if we have uh, Ill acquired illnesses, we want to take berberine. Berberine will promote tyrosine phosphorylation and upregulation of the insulin receptor and its downstream enzymes. It will combat insulin insensitivity due to inflammation, high sugar, high fatty acids. Um, berberine upregulates AMP sensor protein kinase. We discussed its effect on lipids in the prior section. Here we showed that berberine increases expression of the insulin receptor on the cell membrane and upregulates all the molecules in the signaling cascade that mediates insulin function. We're going to lower sugar, we're going to block insulin insensitivity, and we're going to protect our organs from the consequences of chronic hyperglycemia. This, there's a beneficial effect on weight, we're going to blunt oxidative stress, we improve endothelial function, favorable effects on cardiovascular physiology, which we'll talk about in a, in a later section. Um, we will lower lipids. We blunt hyperlipidemia in response to inflammation. Glucose falls. Insulin sensitivity improves. Hyperglycemia due to inflammatory stress is attenuated. Diabetic neuropathy, retinopathy, nephropathy, and cardiomyopathy are attenuated. Weight loss may occur. Fatty liver, liver improves. Blood pressure may fall. Endothelial function improves. Beneficial effects post-stent placement and heart failure, berberine synergizes with and adds to standard pharmaceutical measures. And again, how do we use it? In lipid management and glucose management, 500 milligrams twice a day, we could advance to three doses a day. Sometimes they use 1,000 milligrams twice a day, and we know that, that berberine will synergize with other forms of diabetic management. The concerns, 5% of individuals will have GI side effects, constipation or diarrhea, and this will, de this will resolve if you decrease the dose. If you're taking insulin or a sulfonylurea drug that kicks insulin out of the pancreas and we add in berberine, the drugs will start to work better, we'll have to cut back on the drug dose or your sugar will fall too low, and there's been a single case report of a low heart rate that was reversible with berberine, which we'll talk about in the cardiovascular section. So the chronicles will continue in the next section on DVD2 when we examine berberine in inflammation, toxicity, apoptosis, autoimmunity, and malignancy, which I describe as Dr. Poling's nephews, nuclear factor kappa beta, activated protein 1, NERF2, and KEEP1. This section of the chronicles deals with the role of berberine in inflammation, toxicity, apoptosis, autoimmunity, and malignancy, otherwise described as a discussion of Dr. Poling's nephews, nuclear factor kappa beta, activator protein 1, NERF2, and KEEP. We entered Narnia through the wardrobe, took the appropriate path by the lamppost, and we learned and hopefully we retained great knowledge to allow us to do good. But while in Narnia, we learned that not all was well. A band of goblins and ghouls and evil elves, led by the vile Queen Jadis, sought to kill the human children and conquer the good people of Narnia and make it winter forever, but never Christmas. Jadis forced her subjects into Jadis' care. If seven million people did not sign up, the rest would be turned to stone and their physicians emasculated. So a pitched battle was fought on the plains of Narnia, a battle of good versus inflammatory evil. The human children, who were the generals of the Narnian army, saw that 
Queen Jadis and her colleague, Countess Junk, sought to translocate into the hearts and minds of the good people of Narnia scarcity, jealousy, and inequality, and keep out Sir Nerf, who promulgated equality and justice and a sense of abundance. So as the human children of the good people of Narnia learn the sources of inflammatory evil, they gained the deep magic of Narnia and used it to vanquish forever evil inflammation. And of course, this is our job to vanquish forever cardiovascular inflammation. And I'm going to return to my primary point in that hyperlipidemia is the body's response to perceived infection. The natural predator of man is infection. We've been dying of infection for three million years. We've become quite good at recognizing and dealing with infection. And when you have an infection, you need to make more white cells. To make more white cells, you need more cholesterol. So of course, you're going to upregulate cholesterol generation. And our body can't tell the difference between real inflammation from microbes and the pseudo-inflammation that we experience from a high sugar, a high fat diet, from visceral fat, from toxins, organic pollutants and metals, leaky gut, gingivitis, infection, and allergy. So we're in this constant state of dealing with pseudo-infection. So we're going to upregulate HMG CoA reductase and make a lot more cholesterol. But we need more than cholesterol. We need bullets, we need sugar. So as we activate the cholesterol generation pathway, we generate these isoprenoid molecules, which are signaling molecules. We activate rho kinase, which activates NADPH, NADPH oxidase, which generates superoxide bullets to help our white cells become killing machines. We activate nuclear factor kappa beta when our cells sense a threat such as saturated fatty acids or bacterial cell wall of polysaccharide. A chain reaction of serine kinases is initiated which activate Queen Jadis, ICPA kinase, that degrades the inhibitor of nuclear factor kappa beta. Nuclear factor kappa beta transcription factor translocates into the nucleus and, and begins to change the way we read our DNA to generate inflammatory mediators. This is a pattern, a pathway of inflammation amplification. And this, of course, leads to hyperlipidemia. When we are inflamed, the liver becomes a generator and exporter of cholesterol. The liver makes fewer LDL receptors and more PCSK9. So we're generating lipids in the liver and sending them out into the circulation. And white cells and vascular smooth muscle cells, cells of the artery, begin to esterify their cholesterol. And this allows them to engorge with cholesterol and form lipid droplets within the cells of the artery wall. And when we experience oxidative stress, we're going to damage our LDL. We're going to fragment its protein. And then the LDL looks like a bacteria. And it will be recognized by the scavengers, the, the bacterial receptor receptors on our monocytes. And this will perpetuate the atherosclerotic inflammation. And not only do we need high cholesterol to meet the needs of these rapidly dividing white cells, they need sugar. So we're going to have insulin insensitivity, which is very important when you're dealing with infection. So our blood sugar will rise. Now, this is not really the, way, the pathway to health. What we are recommending is to live a lifestyle that activates AMP-sensitive protein kinase. And this is activated by exercise and appropriate caloric restriction. You don't have to starve yourself, you just have to not overeat. And we can also activate this key enzyme system with berberine. And when we do so, we send a burn, do not build signal to our physiology. So we stop making lipids, we blunt hyperglycemia, and we have a prominent anti-inflammatory effect. Berberine activates AMP-sensitive protein kinase, and all the beneficial effects of berberine follow the AMPK pathway. Now, when we activate AMPK with berberine, we're going to turn off NADPH oxidase. We're going to stop making superoxide free radical. We will blunt inflammatory hyperlipidemia. The liver stops making excessive cholesterol. Our white cells stop engorging on cholesterol. And we, we do this by blocking inflammatory signaling. We're going to keep nuclear factor kappa beta out of the nucleus, as we'll discuss tonight. Berberine blocks this pathway by blocking the toll-like receptor and by increasing uh, a molecule called uh, heme oxygenase, which we'll discuss tonight, and by increasing nitric oxide, which we'll discuss in the next section, we will block activation of Queen Jadis. 
And berberine promotes tyrosine phosphorylation, which will improve insulin signaling and will blunt the insulin insensitivity brought on by, by inflammation. So we've, we've reviewed to this point the first two sections of the Chronicles of Berberine. Now we're going to talk about the role of berberine in dealing with inflammation. Again, AMP-sensitive kinase lowers cholesterol, it lowers sugar, and we will focus on its role tonight in dealing with oxidative stress, inflammation, protecting our cells against toxic apoptosis, and promoting apoptosis, that cell suicide of cells that are going rogue, that are going malignant. And again, by activating AMP sensor protein kinase, we physiologically downregulate HMG coy reductase. We stabilize the messenger RNA for the LDL receptor. We block transcription of PCSK9. We're going to decrease our LDL cholesterol. We're going to block generation of fatty acids. We're going to lower triglycerides. We upregulate the expression of the insulin receptor on the cell membrane, and we improve insulin signaling, blunting insulin resistance brought on by inflammation. Berberine in this pathway helps with weight management and with respect to oxidative inflammatory stress, we block NADPH oxidase, so we're making less superoxide. In the next section, we'll talk about uncoupling protein. We'll be focusing in this section on blocking nuclear factor kappa beta translocation, activator protein 1 uh, binding to the DNA, and promoting translocation of NERF 2, which codes for antioxidant and antitoxicity enzyme systems. We protect against tissue damage from essentially any insult, but apoptosis, cell suicide of cells that have gone malignant, is enhanced. Endothelial function improves, cardiovascular physiology improves, clinical effects that we've discussed um, on lipids and glucose in our prior two sections. We, we suggest, based upon the animal studies and the cell culture studies, that berberine will provide protection against malignancy, protection against cell damage due to infection and chronic inflammation, ischemia, oxygen deficiency, toxicity, tolerance to radiation therapy in humans is enhanced. Berberine and COX-2 induction, that cyclooxygenase, Oral cancer is the fifth leading cause of male cancer mortality in Taiwan. The culprit is a cultural uh, habit of chewing areca quid, which is betel nut. So they enjoy chewing betel nut, and this causes oral cavity inflammation. COX-2 expression and subsequent production of prostaglandin E2 is associated with the initiation and proliferation of GI tract cancers. The protein and messenger RNA expression of COX-2 is high in tissues with areca quid related oral cancer. It's intermediate to high in adjacent non-disease regions, and it's low in gum tissue of healthy individuals. COX-2 induction is thus likely a key mechanism of malignant conversion. Berberine has been in traditional use to treat oral cavity inflammation in the Orient. So the question is, does berberine possess anti-COX-2 activity? So we're going to look at two human oral cancer cell lines. We're going to study them in tissue culture. The KB cells are associated with low basal prostaglandin E2 formation. They're less aggressive. The OC2 cells make a lot of PGE2, and they are more aggressive. So we're going to record PGE2 production for these cancer cells following incubation with berberine at increasing concentrations with or without a COX-2 inducer. This is an agent that will increase COX-2 activity versus a COX-2 inhibitor, a Vioxx-like drug that will block cyclooxidase activity. Phospholipases release arachidonic acid, an essential fatty acid from the cell membrane. Cyclooxygenase converts it to PGE2, PGH2, and then downstream mediators that promote inflammation, platelet aggregation, and cardiovascular disease. So the KB cells don't make a whole lot of PGA2 at rest, but they will when they're stimulated with the COX-2 agonist. However, we can see at rest or following stimulation, there's a dose-related decrease in the production of PGA2 cells when we incubate them with berberine. The OC2 cells make a lot of PGA2 at rest or if they're stimulated. And again, berberine in a dose-related fashion will blunt conversion of arachidonic acid into PGE2 cells, into PGE2 in these cells. 
And if we look at the ability of berberine to block production of PGE2, to block cyclooxidative activity, it is as effective as the Vioxx-like drug. So the question is, is berberine a COX-2 inhibitor? Is it like Vioxx? Well, that would be a good thing because it would lower inflammation, but we know that Vioxx increases our risk of cardiovascular disease. When we block the activity of an enzyme with the drug, we get rid of a bad thing, but we also get rid of good things. Is berberine going to, going to be associated with these characteristics? Will berberine lower inflammation but increase our risk of cardiovascular disease? We need to examine this. So here in a test tube situation, a cell, cell free conditions, we're going to look at PGE2 generated from arachidonic acid by berberine or the COX-2 inhibitor. The COX-2 inhibitor poisons the enzyme like a statin poisons HMG coil reductase and blocks PG2 formation. Berberine has no effect, which means berberine is not directly poisoning the enzyme. Again, it, it physiologically downregulates HMG coil reductase so you make less cholesterol. Statins poison the enzyme. The Vioxx drugs block PG2, they poison it. Berberine's not doing that. Well, then how is it working? What it's doing, it's blocking the transcription of the messenger RNA for COX-2. That's a better way of creating a clinical effect. Instead of poisoning an enzyme, we will make less of it. And the, the Vioxx-like drug has no effect. So berberine blocks COX-2 transcription, just as it, we saw that it blocks transcription of PCSK9. That helps with lipid control. Here it's blocking COX-2 transcription. What is the mechanism? Here we're going to look at binding of, at the level of the DNA of Queen Jadis, her, her spawn, nuclear factor kappa beta, and activate a protein 1. Now, berberine does not block binding of nuclear factor kappa beta to the DNA. It works by preventing its translocation from the cell fluid into the nucleus. But berberine will enter the nucleus, sit on the promoter site of activator protein 1, and block its ability to read the DNA. So two key inflammatory pathways are blocked, but by different mechanisms, with berberine. And it's very important that we understand there are many pathways of inflammation amplification that we need to consider all of them. Consider if our cell membranes are exposed to tumor necrosis factor alpha. By one pathway, we activate queen jadis, we activate ICPA kinase, allowing nuclear factor kappa beta to translocate into the nucleus, change the way we read our DNA to make more inflammatory mediators, such as tumor necrosis factor alpha. And we've talked about how berberine can blunt this. Uh, there's another pathway. You activate tumor necrosis factor alpha receptor, and you activate MEKK, which is mitogen active protein kinase kinase, that, activate, that activates an MEK such as junk, C June N terminal kinase that causes activator protein 1 to translocate into the nucleus and make more TNF. So there's many pathways that we need to pay attention to. Fortunately, berberine blocks both of these key pathways. Um, activator protein 1 is a dimer of two, they're called phospholipid proteins, that enters the DNA and and when it binds to its promoter site, you make inflammatory um, mediators that are, pl play a role in pathological inflammation and in atherosclerosis. We want to blunt this. But we don't want to wipe it out. There are drugs that will block the tumor necrosis factor alpha receptor. These are the drugs that are advertised on television to treat rheumatoid arthritis. They knock it out completely. But there is a caution that if you have heart disease, don't take these drugs because they will worsen your outcome. You see, when Mother Nature opens up an inflammatory pathway, such as activator protein 1, she also opens up an anti-inflammatory, anti-cell death pathway. And when we knock out a pathway completely with one of these arthritis drugs, we take away the bad and we take away the good, which is why it increases cardiovascular death rate when we hammer something down with the drug. We don't do that with berberine and nutritional substances. We turn down a pathway or we block its induction. Now, let's give you an animal model example. We're going to take male Wistar rats. We're going to create an infrascapular air pocket. We make a little pouch under their skin full of air. 
And seven days later, you're going to administer into their peritoneal cavity berberine at increasing doses or indomethacin, which is a COX-2 inhibitor that we use to treat gout and inflammatory arthritis. One hour after the intraperitoneal treatment, you're going to inject carrageenan into the air pouch. That is an irritant that's going to cause local inflammation. Six hours later, you look at the amount of fluid and the contents of the fluid in this subcutaneous pouch. The question, will berberine and or indomethacin blunt the expected inflammatory response? If you look at the volume of fluid in the pouch, we call that an exudate. It, of course, is, is, is increased with the, the irritant and is blocked with indomethacin, a COX-2 inhibitor, and in a dose-related fashion, it's blocked with berberine because with, with the carrageenan, we're translocating activator protein one to the nucleus. We're going to make a lot of PGE2. This is blocked with the COX-2 inhibitor, and it's blocked with berberine in a dose-related fashion. Inflammatory stimuli cause our body to make phospholipase A2. That's a, a known risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It works by releasing arachidonic acid from the cell membrane. COX-2 converts it to PGE2 and then to inflammatory mediators such as matrix metalloproteinases, um, leukotrienes that mediate pain and fever, thromboxane A2, which causes your platelets to be sticky. And this is all brought to you care of Countess Junk and Queen Ikba, and we don't knock them out completely, but we downregulate them with berberine and other nutritional therapies. Next study, we're going to take genetically normal mice randomize them to a three-day treatment of Ig, that's intragastric distilled water or berberine. Then we're going to treat them all with intraperitoneal lipopolysaccharide. That is the toxic um, component of the bacteria cell membrane that causes inflammation. When you have shock, it's due to lipopolysaccharide. So we're going to do an intraperitoneal injection, and so we're going to create sepsis such as you would experience if a, um, you had a, a, a ruptured appendix and bacteria were released in the peritoneal cavity. And we're going to evaluate parameters of lung injury. Now, we're injecting lipopolysaccharide in the belly, but we're going to look at what effect this focal inflammation has on the systemic inflammatory response. The lungs of these animals don't look so good, but there's protection with berberine, and survival is dramatically enhanced if the animals receive berberine. Tumor necrosis factor alpha rises in the serum and in the lung tissue following lipopolysaccharide injection of the peritoneal cavity, and you can see that this is blunted in the serum and in the lung tissue with berberine. That makes sense because lipopolysaccharide binds the toll-like 4 receptor that activates queen jadis that causes nuclear factor kappa beta to go to the nucleus and make more tumor necrosis factor alpha. We blunt this pathway with berberine. We're going to get less inflammation in the serum and in the lung tissue. Alveolar, that's the air sacs of the lung, phospholipase A2 is induced with lipopolysaccharide. This is prevented with berberine pretreatment. Thromboxane B2 and leukotriene B4 are the work products of arachidonic acid being converted uh, by cyclooxase 2. And of course, this is induced with lipopolysaccharide and it's dramatically blunted with berberine. With berberine, the levels of thromboxane B2, which is the stable uh, measuring stick for thromboxane A2, are actually below control conditions. Let's look at, at genetically normal rats on a standard uh, chow diet, and you're going to administer intraperitoneal lipopolysaccharide with increasing doses. You're going to sacrifice them all 12 hours later and look at the level of white blood cell adherence to the venous endothelium. So for this to occur, the white cells need to be activated. The endothelial surface needs to be activated. These white cells are adhering. They're going to translocate into the endothelium and initiate an inflammatory response. And you can see the more lipopolysaccharide that is injected um, into the belly, the greater is the inflammatory response, the more white cells are adhering to the endothelial cells within the lung. How can we influence this? We'll take these uh, male rats and randomize them to receive vehicle, that's a control group, lipopolysaccharide or lipopolysaccharide with berberine, low dose or high dose, one hour, just one hour before we induce uh, peritoneal sepsis by injecting lipopolysaccharide. You're going to sacrifice them all 12 hours later, look at the degree of white cell adherence to the pulmonary vascular wall, and you'll see that with lipopolysaccharide, there's a lot of white cells adhering to the endothelial surface. This is blunted in a dose-related fashion if you pretreat with berberine just one hour before the um, lipopolysaccharide exposure. Now, for the white cells to bind to the 
artery wall, the endothelial cells need to make adhesion molecules such as VCAM, and that is blunted um, with berberine because VCAM is a work product of nuclear factor kappa beta, so of course we would, we would expect that VCAM production would be blunted. Berberine and lipopolysaccharide induced white cell adhesion. Here we're going to look at human umbilical vein endothelial cells and tissue culture. The umbilical cord is your vascular connection to the placenta. And soon after birth, of course, it collapses and atrophies. So you can take the umbilical cord and harvest the cells and um, you can bank them in case you might want to use them as a stem cell replacement therapy for yourself later on in life, but they are a very good source of cells for uh, human tissue culture studies because they're young and healthy. So we're going to take these QVIX, human umbilical vein endothelial cells, and we're going to pretreat them for one hour with vehicle, that's the control group, or increasing dose of the berberine. Then we're going to add in to the test tube situation lipopolysaccharide to induce inflammation and human monocyte cells. And we're going to see to what degree will these white cells adhere to the endothelial surface following stimulation with lipopolysaccharide. So what you see with lipopolysaccharide, there's a lot of white cells adhering to the endothelial cells, and this is blunted again in a dose-related fashion with berberine. We're going, to pre we're going to take these Huvix, pre-treat with increasing doses of berberine for one hour, then incubate over four hours with lipopolysaccharide, evaluate VCAM protein and messenger RNA expression. VCAM is an adhesion molecule. What is the level of expression of the protein, and are the cells transcribing it from their DNA? And of course, what you see with lipopolysaccharide stimulation, you're making more VCAM1, and this is occurring. You're transcribing it from your DNA because nuclear factor kappa beta is translocating into the nucleus. And of course, we can blunt that with berberine, so you see less with berberine. Um, berberine and lipopolysaccharide-induced septic injury. We're going to take genetically normal mice, divide them into treatment groups. There's a control group, get sterile water, intragastic, and followed by intraperitoneal saline. Another group gets sterile water for one, three, or five days. Then they are treated with intraperitoneal lipopolysaccharide. A third group gets berberine for one, three, or five days, followed by saline. A fourth group is pre-treated with berberine, and then they are treated then with lipopolysaccharide to induce a, a peritoneal septic situation. You're going to look at the effect of survival. Will pre-treatment with berberine enhance survival with this experimental uh, bacterial peritoni peritonitis situation, and you can see it does. Lipopolysaccharide is fairly lethal. Only 22% of the mice survive for 48 hours, but berberine one, two, and three days provides protection. So berberine will decrease your risk of dying of bacterial sepsis, at least in this animal model, and it appears that five days of treatment provides the best result. So they repeated the study. They're going to have the control group, the lipopolysaccharide group, Another group gets berberine at increasing doses for five days, and then the fourth group, pre-treat with berberine, then you insult them with lipopolysaccharide injections in the peritoneal cavity. We're going to look at the effect on survival, and you can see that berberine at low and intermediate dose dramatically improves survival. High dose, it, it still is better than nothing, but, but in this situation, more is not better. Ask yourself, why is that? Why would more of a powerful antioxidant not be better? Keep that thought in mind, and we'll answer that question later on. Now, another study, we're going to take genetically normal mice, treat them. There's a control group. There's a lipopolysaccharide group. There's a group that receives berberine for five days, and then a fourth group receives berberine followed by lipopolysaccharide. And 24 hours after exposure to lipopolysaccharide, you're going to look at cytokine levels in the circulation. You're going to euthanize the animals and look at the organs histology. That's the appearance of the tissues under the microscope. Tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-12, TH1 um, inflammatory cytokines, that's blunted with berberine. Nitric oxide, this is nitrate reflecting inducible nitric oxide. This is bullet nitric oxide. Um, an inflammatory mediator rises with lipopolysaccharide. We're blending that with berberine. Interleukin-10 is an, an, an anti-inflammatory cytokine. Whenever Mother Nature initiates an inflammatory pathway, she'll initiate a T-regulatory anti-inflammatory pathway, and IL-10 is a regulatory anti-inflammatory cytokine, and that anti-inflammatory response is enhanced with berberine. 
Now, the lungs don't look so hot with lipopolysaccharide, and there's less lung tissue damage with berberine. This is the lining of the GI tract. These are the villi, the little finger-like expressions in, into the gut wall through which we absorb nutrients. You can see that they're being degraded by lipopolysaccharide, and there's pres some preservation with berberine. Another study of berberine and lipopolysaccharide-induced intestinal injury, genetically normal mice, a control group, a berberine group, a lipopolysaccharide group, a group that is pretreated with berberine for three days, followed by lipopolysaccharide, euthanize all at 12 hours, and evaluate intestinal pathology. And you can see the lipopolysaccharide group doesn't look so good. Villus height, the, the, the uh, degree of absorption surface that is preserved, is blunted with inflammatory injury that's preserved with berberine. Intestinal permeability, that's leaky gut, you might say. And we get acute leaky gut with lipopolysaccharide. So uh, undigested uh, food particles and bacteria are gonna translocate across the gut wall. We don't like that. That will aggravate and perpetuate inflammation and that is blunted with berberine. Myeloperoxidase is another enzyme that generates free radicals like NADPH oxidase that is induced with lipopolysaccharide. It's blunted by berberine. Macrophage inflammatory protein is, is, a, is a molecule that pulls in more white cells that is blunted by berberine. Toll-like uh, 4 receptor. Now, lipopolysaccharide binds the toll-like 4 receptor to initiate this inflammatory cascade, and this allows um, uh, Queen Jadis, ICPA, to become phosphorylated to shoot more nuclear factor kappa beta inactive in the nucleus, and it's going to make more toll-like receptors. So there's a, a vicious circle of inflammation, which is a great idea when you're fighting a real bacteria, but it's a terrible idea when you're modern Western man chronically dealing with pseudo-infection. The toll-like receptor, you know, our white cells have phagocytic receptors that recognize and engulf microbes. The toll-like receptor is a threat receptor, and it's on the cell membrane of, of all of our cells, particularly our white cells, and it will recognize bacterial cell wall lipopolysaccharide, saturated fatty acids, there's high sugar, high fat diet, um, tumor necrosis factor alpha, cellular debris, something's wrong and we're gonna fire up the immune system. And here is a schematic of the toll-like 4 receptor. It's really called the toll-like 4 myeloid differentiation factor 88 receptor. Lipopolysaccharide binds it and we initiate these chain reactions of, of uh, inflammation amplification. Well, in most of our cells, particularly liver, we can modify the toll-like receptor so it will respond to free fatty acids. So if you have a high sugar, high fat diet, if you're taking in a lot of um, uh, high fructose corn syrup in soda pops, that is just like you're drinking bacteria because our body recognizes that as an inflammatory threat. And we're gonna activate the, the uh, nuclear factor kappa beta and the um, activator protein one pathways. Here's a schematic of the toll-like receptor and how lipopolysaccharide fits into this. This is a lock and key situation. We call this a ligand receptor interaction. Here we have the um, toll-like 4 receptor with three berberine molecules, and if you add water, they fit in quite well, and they bind tightly. So we feel that berberine may work um, not just by blocking activation of Queen Jadis, um, ICPA kinase, but by actually preventing lipopolysaccharide from binding to the toll-like receptor and firing up this inflammatory pathway. Now, we've been talking about berberine like it's a drug. It's been studied like a drug. It's a single molecule because we Western allopathic physicians are used to studying one molecule at a time. But in traditional medicine, in Eastern medicine, plant extracts are used. And berberine is basically the most abundant biologically active molecule in beneficial herbal treatments such as Coptis chinensis French. But these other molecules have long names that are difficult to pronounce that also have anti-inflammatory properties. As a general rule, in herbal medicine and Eastern medicine, the whole plant is more beneficial than its primary molecule. So let's take a look here. We're going to compare berberine as a single molecule versus Coptis chinensis French in lipopolysaccharide-induced sepsis. So we're going to take genetically normal rats. 
all received 14 days of intragastric treatment followed by a single intraperitoneal infection. One group gets sterile water followed by saline. One group gets sterile water followed by lipopolysaccharide. And then the experimental groups get lower high-dose berberine or Coptis chinensis French. And because it's a whole plant and you're getting all these other molecules, you would use a somewhat lower dose. And you're going to do lab and tissue analysis six hours after inducing sepsis. Tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1 beta, nitric oxide, that's bullet nitric oxide generated by inflammatory mediators, it's undesirable, is upregulated with lipopolysaccharide, berberine at both doses and coptitis are all effective in blunting this. So the whole plant's working as well, if not better, than the isolated berberine molecule. With respect to villus injury of the intestine, now this intestinal wall doesn't look so good. There's protection with berberine. Curiously, lower dose berberine works a little bit better than high dose. Again, more is not necessarily better, and the, uh, the whole plant extract worked quite well as well. Um, Toll-like 4 positive staining um, is upregulated lipopolysaccharide, protection with berberine and coptis. Nuclear factor kappa beta, same situation. It, now, we're going to look at the gut wall. Malondialdehyde is a marker of free radical stress. We talked about that as a marker of, of LDL or cell membrane phospholipid oxidation. This is happening in this inflammatory situation. Nitric oxide in the ileum, that's, that's one section of the gut wall, increases, and it's blunted with berberine and coptis. Superoxide dismutase and glutathione peroxidase are key antioxidant enzymes. Healthy people have a lot of this stuff. Unhealthy people don't have much, and they're subjected to free radical stress. Well, you could see with lipopolysaccharide, there's a slight uptick in superoxide dismutase and glutathione peroxidase. Now, lipopolysaccharide's a bad thing. It's causing inflammation. Why is it also increasing our antioxidant defenses? Does lipopolysaccharide provide antioxidant protection? How does this all work? We'll answer this question later on, but you can see that the animals that received lipopolysaccharide and berberine and coptitis, there was a synergy with a greater uptick in our counterbalancing antioxidant defenses. 200 male Wistar rats. Let's look at berberine in liver protection. We've just demonstrated that it protects our organs from septic inflammation. What about toxic um, inflammation. Um, we're going to take 200 genetically normal rats. Control group gets standard rat chow, water, and housing. The fibrotic group go on a high uh, carbohydrate, high fat diet, very unhealthy diet. They're 10% they're, uh, ethanol in their drinking water. At day eight, you begin to treat them with subcutaneous carbon tetrachloride, which is a known liver toxin. Um, so basically, they spend their time at McDonald's and in the bar, then they go work in a laundromat and get exposed to carbon tetrachloride, and this is going to cause liver injury and fibrosis. Fourth group gets the bad diet, the alcohol, the carbon tetrachloride, but they're, they're treated with berberine concomitantly. You're going to sacrifice all at four weeks and look at the liver under the microscope. Will berberine protect the liver against this uh, exogenous toxicity? Now. With the fibrotic diet, the animals lose weight because they're sick and scrawny. Berberine has no effect. The liver increases in size with the toxic diet and the alcohol and the carbon tetrachloride. This is called hepatomegaly. And there's, there's less hepatomegaly with berberine. Transaminases, those are your liver chemistries. Um, obviously, they rise with the bad diet, and there's protection with berberine in a dose-related fashion. Malondialdehyde, a marker of oxidative stress, you know, that was induced in the, um, in the gut wall of the animals with the experimental peritoneal sepsis. We're seeing the same, the same evidence of free radical stress with the toxic diet on the livers. Superoxide dismutase, which protects against oxidative stress, is decreased with the bad diet, and there's amelioration, preservation with berberine. Alpha smooth muscle actin is a marker of fibrosis, scarring, liver fibrosis, and cirrhosis. It is induced, it's blended with berberine. Transforming growth factor beta is, in general, an anti inflammatory cytokine. It's a uh, T reg cytokine, and in a sense, it's protective against inflammation, but in chronic toxic conditions, um, it is associated with fibrosis. So here, it's a sign of liver fibrosis. It rises with the bad diet and the alcohol and the carbon tetrachloride, and it's blunted with berberine. How the liver looks under the microscope, here's normal liver. Here's this fatty, dysfunctional liver. 
It looks a little bit better with berberine. Collagen deposition, a marker of fibrosis in the liver, is blunted. Why is this working? We're blocking queen jadis, nuclear factor kappa beta. We're blocking countess junk, activator protein 1. We're blocking the inflammatory TH1, TH17 immune dysregulation that mediates autoimmunity against the liver and liver fibrosis. And with berberine, we're translocating NERF2, our transcription factor for antioxidant and toxic protection enzymes. Berberine and pulmonary radiation injury. 90 patients with non-small cell lung cancer. They were felt to be good candidates for radiation therapy. FEV1, the amount of air that you can exhale in one second, was at least 50% of normal. Diffusion capacity, the ability of carbon dioxide and oxygen to diffuse across the lung wall was at least 50% of normal. They were expected to live at least six months. So they were good candidates for radiation therapy. You do a baseline assessment, randomize them to receive over six weeks berberine, 20 milligrams per kilogram each day, or placebo. They all undergo the same therapeutic radiation in an attempt to kill their um, lung cancer cells. And you're gonna evaluate the survivors at six months. 85 of the 90 survived, two died from metastatic disease, one from really radiation-induced lung disease and metastatic disease, two died from cardiovascular disease. Now, ICAM-1 and transforming growth factor one rise in response to radiation lung injury because the, the lung is damaged, the immune system gets involved and causes reparative fibrosis. This is expected with radiation therapy to the lung and it's a bad sign. And you could see that the rise in these um, cytokines is blunted with berberine. And the less rise in these cytokines, the less likely is the patient expected to have radiation-induced lung injury because you're blocking this immune response to the lung damage that you inadvertently create when you're trying to kill the cancer cells with the radiation therapy. All the subjects experience a deterioration of pulmonary function at six weeks in blue and um, six months in red, force vital capacity, how much air you can exhale all at once FEV1, how much you can exhale in, in one second, and the diffusion capacity decreased, but you could see it decreased less in the berberine group um, in, in all three categories. They grade radiation-induced lung injury as grade one, grade two, grade three. You can see there was less grade one uh, injury with berberine, less grade two, and no grade three. So, you know, nearly 10% of the placebo patients had a severe grade three, none with the berberine uh, treatment. So berberine blunted the deterioration in lung function in response to radiation therapy. Well, would it affect, would it adversely affect the cancer killing uh, result of the radiation therapy? That was not the case. 14% um, of the placebo patients went into complete remission. The tumor was no longer visible, 17% with berberine. That wasn't statistically significant, but we're going in the right direction. No change in partial remission or stable disease. 14% of the placebo patients, it didn't help. They had progressive disease, only 1% with the berberine-treated uh, uh, patients. So there was a synergy between radiation therapy and berberine. Survival was better in the berberine group. So berberine affecting radiation therapy, the inflammatory response is attenuated. Preservation of pulmonary function, radiation efficacy is not compromised. Survival is not compromised. All good things. Berberine and prostate cancer apoptosis. Apoptosis is cell suicide. The cells don't die. They're encouraged to commit suicide. And when a, a cell goes cancerous, um, natural killer cells and CD8 cells recognize it and they interact with it, and they initiate a suicide pathway. Let's see what effect berberine will have on cell suicide of, cell, of prostate cells that have turned malignant. We're going to look at four human prostate cell lines in tissue culture. One is an androgen-sensitive prostate cancer. Two are androgen-insensitive. In other words, they will not respond to testosterone deprivation therapy. They are a more malignant, more aggressive uh, line of prostate cancer. And then we have um, normal prostate cells that are not neoplastic. They're not cancerous. You're going to incubate them with increasing doses of berberine over increasing time periods. Evaluate the effects on parameters of cell proliferation and viability. Well, if you look at the normal prostate cells, 
You can't hurt them with berberine until you get to unphysiologically high doses that we would never achieve with oral therapy. So berberine is not toxic to the normal prostate cells. However, it's very toxic to the cancerous cells. You can see cell viability is lost, cell death in response to berberine, uh, increases in a dose and time related fashion. Again, berberine activates AMP sensitive protein kinase that sends a burn do not build signal. You don't want to waste energy on rapid cell proliferation. So berberine slows down the rate of cell proliferation. And when we slow down the rate of cell proliferation, we have more time to repair cells. You know, our cells are off, we're, many of our cells are going cancerous all the time, but then our body has a chance to repair them. If we slow down the rate of cell division, we have more time to repair them. Or if the cell is going to go cancerous and it can't be recovered, if we slow this process down, we have more time for our natural killer cells to kill it. So we, the berberine is not toxic to the normal cells that are not dividing rapidly, but the cancer cells that are dividing rapidly, berberine is toxic. Berberine causes what's called G1 phase cell cycle arrest. Our, our, our cells are dividing in phases and we're putting them in pause. And when you're in pause, we have more time to repair or more time for our natural killer cells to kill them. And this is occurring in all the cancer cells, but not in the normal cells. See, the normal cells are not dividing too rapidly. Berberine's not going to slow them down. It's only the cancer cells that are slowed down. Um, our cells divide utilizing a, a machinery such as cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. And then there are cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors that block cell cycling. Um, and it's an, it, there's an interaction between the um, cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors and cyclin-dependent kinase binding. And berberine changes the transcription of these factors in a, in a means that slows down the rate of cell division. Um, and you can see that berberine kills the cancer cells. It has no effect on the normal cells. And the way this works is apoptosis may occur when the mitochondria fails. So there's oxidative stress and energy production failure in the mitochondria. The electrochemical gradient across the mitochondrial cell membrane is lost. And then we see an increase in apoptotic mediators, such as BACs, and a decrease in our anti-apoptotic molecules such as Beckel, and then we have an increase in the Bax to Beckel ratio, and that causes release of cytochrome C, a mitochondrial protein, into the cell fluid that activates this cell suicide pathway. And in cancer cells, but not in normal cells, this is potentiated um, by berberine. And we, we release the um, uh, cytochrome C, we have this high level of Bax to Beckel, and then these executioner enzymes such as caspase and PARP, which is poly ADP ribose polymerase, they're activated, and that causes the cells to commit suicide. And this is, these are, there's another assay of apoptosis called the uh, comet assay, and you look at the length of the tail of the comet, and these are kind of pretty pictures, and this is another marker of apoptosis uh, that is brought on by berberine in the cancer cells. Okay, what about berberine and doxyrubicin cardiotoxicity? Doxyrubicin is another name for adriamycin, an incredibly effective chemotherapeutic agent, but it's, it's dose limited by cardiac toxicity. Doxyrubicin will cause apoptosis of the heart cells. So your, your cancer may be responding to adriamycin, but the dose needs to be decreased or therapy stopped early because it's damaging the heart. So what effect will berberine have? So we're gonna take cells and tissue culture Cardio, these are healthy cardiomyocytes from um, uh, one-day-old uh, genetically normal rats or a line of breast cancer cells and tissue culture that are used in cell culture studies. You're going to incubate them for 24 hours with doxyrubicin, adriamycin, the chemotherapeutic agent, berberine, or both evaluate parameters of cell viability. LDH release from the normal health, healthy cells, that's a marker of the, the cell membrane is rupturing. You would see that in a heart attack. And you can see that the chemotherapeutic agent is toxic to the heart muscle cells with the release of LDH that is blunted in dose-related fashion by berberine. Conversely, if you look at the rate of growth inhibition, the chemotherapeutic effect, 
doxycycline is quite effective in killing the breast cancer cells and its ability to kill the breast cancer cells is actually augmented with berberine until you get to a really high dose. So again, this is the same situation we saw with radiation-induced lung disease. Um, berberine, not only does it not blunt the effect of the radiation therapy, the chemotherapy, it actually augments it, at least in this cell culture study. And if we look at apoptosis of the cardiac cells, it's increased by doxycycline, and we're protecting against cell suicide um, in response to the chemotherapy with berberine in a dose-related fashion. And again, the um, adriamycin increases levels of cytochrome C, the backs to Beckel ratio, and then the executioner enzymes are activated. The cells are going to commit suicide. This is blunted in the normal heart cells with berberine. And if this looks at um, mitochondrial power failure, which is the beginning of apoptosis, this is occurring with doxycycline, and it's being prevented with uh, berberine. So if we take um, uh, genetically normal male rats, and randomize them to a control group, a group that gets doxyrubicin, adriamycin, a berberine group, and a group that receives doxyrubicin and rescue berberine, you can see that survival is enhanced with berberine pretreatment. And then you're going to, on some of the animals, you're going to uh, sacrifice them at three days and look at the heart muscle under the microscope. There's less apoptosis with berberine and less activation of the executioner enzymes with berberine. So berberine is protecting the heart from toxicity from adriamycin in this animal model. If you look at the, these are the normal heart cells. They don't look so good with adriamycin. They look better with berberine. There's less release of LDH um, from the uh, heart cells. So berberine and doxorubicin cardiotoxicity, it promotes apoptosis of malignant cells. Same thing as with the prostate. Basically, the biochemistry of prostate cancer and breast cancer is pretty much one and the same. The same pathways are involved. No toxicity to the, the normal non-neoplastic cells. No inhibition of chemotherapy-induced apoptosis of malignant cells. Protects the cardiomyocytes against doxorubicin-induced apoptosis. Now, this is the end of part one of our inflammation reduction section. And now please uh, move on to disc three and we'll proceed with part two of Dr. Poling's nephews.